Thank you so much, Amy. So I was reading over what I've written for today because I thought I would like to talk it rather than read it. But it became clear to me that what I had written sounds like writing. And so even if I were to have memorized it and never looked down, it would still sound like writing. Um, whenever I think hard about something, it comes out as writing. So think about this as a letter, a letter that I've written to you. It's nice to hear this presentation of successes by Amy, um, especially on a day where I've elected to talk about failure. It must seem like an unlikely topic for my farewell address to the college. Though I'm sure few speakers would choose this topic just when new students are settling in and seniors are summoning their best energies for the thesis year, it has a certain relevance. Though no one would recommend putting a list of failures on your resume, the vita, as we call it, is supposed to be a summary of the important events in one's career, one's life, in fact, the curriculum vitae. And without the missteps, the rejections, the blind alleys we all have to confront, it is inevitably a partial resume at best. Failure is a good topic, I think, for somebody at my time of life. Because as one gets older, one's mistakes come into clearer focus, but without the emotional baggage that they once had. It could be said that, and I'm going to say that, um, success blinds, but failure illuminates. Another reason to talk about failure today is that it has become a hot topic. I first began thinking about it a couple of years ago when a former student sent me a copy of something that she was working on in graduate school, an autoethnography. Like many of the students, it's been my pleasure and honor to work with here at Scripps. Leslie, not her real name, was talented and motivated. I don't usually teach creative writing but she convinced me that it might be in my interest to do so by showing me some quite beautiful poems that she had written, um, which though somber in themselves, made me weep with joy. Now, some years later, she sent me a piece called The Art of Falling, Failing, and Forgiving which is actually about her torturous years at Scripps, struggling with an eating disorder, something I knew nothing about at the time. She begins with a quotation from an art critic, Christian Revson, who writes, the fall marks a sudden awareness that the world may be completely different from what was originally expected that our control over social life or nature can suddenly be lost. And then she opens her part of the essay with these words. Falling is an act of creation. Something new emerges through the fall. A phoenix, a self we didn't have access to before we fell. Falling forces me to get back up. Something is produced in the courage to fall. Falling doesn't just occur because of accidents or lack of coordination. Falling involves risk. After reading Leslie's essay in the spring of 2012, I found talk of falling and failure everywhere. What follows is just a random set of examples. Who can forget 
the graphics at the beginning of every episode of Mad Men. When the Donald Draper cutout, Draper is a fiendishly successful advertising executive, falls in slow motion from a great height. And then there's Jeff Bezos. You know who Jeff Bezos is, right? The founder of Amazon and the one who just bought the Washington Post. If you Google Jeff Bezos, who's described as the only dot-com executive who is still innovating, you will find an article called Four Lessons Jeff Bezos Learned from Failure. And my son, I was telling my son about this talk, and my son who works for the information giant Thomson Reuters, told me that at their last national convention, there was a required one hour session on failure. Then of course, there's Henri the existential cat. <laughs> For those of you who like me are cat people. Henri quotes Jean-Paul Sartre to the effect that all actions are theoretically equal and equally exposed to failure. Henri luxuriates in the meaninglessness of his condition, which somehow strikes us as very funny. But what about the things I teach? What about American literature? The other day, I opened a new book of poetry called Red Dock by a poet I admire Anne Carson. There was the epigraph from the existential writer Samuel Beckett staring me in the face. Try again, fail again, fail better. If you think about it, American literature is all about failure. In Moby Dick, Ahab does not realize his goal of killing the white whale. And even the noble Queequeg goes down with the ship. One of my other favorite writers, Henry James, is the premier poet of the novel of failure. And in The Ambassadors, Lambert Strether, who proclaims himself a lost cause, is James's embodiment. Then there is the narrator in Toni Morrison's Beloved, who after 400 pages, says, this is not a story to pass on. Odd to end a novel this way. Of course, the narrator is not Toni Morrison. In fact, all these examples might be viewed otherwise as not proclaiming, but examining failure. Success blinds, but failure illuminates. This is why I have entitled my remarks Permutations of Failure. Permutation, as many of you know, is a mathematical term in which items in a sequence change places. Items such as success, adequacy, failure. How should we understand them? Which is which? On the subject of permutation, let me add that Teaching the Great Gatsby, a book that many of my students love, has been instructive. It is about many failures. Gatsby's, Nick's, Tom's, Daisy's, Myrtle's, Wilson's. Even the self-promoting Jordan Baker admits that she made a big mistake in trusting Nick. I always found the ending quite dark. Here in these final words, Nick is musing about Gatsby's dream in these famous lines which many of you know. He had come a long way to this blue lawn and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city 
where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch our arms out further, and one fine morning, so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Finishing this book, I say to myself, misquoting Milton, dark, 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 intolerably dark amid the blaze of noon. But my students claim they are not dismayed by Fitzgerald's ending. It is the idea of beating on boats against the current that seems hopeful to them. Mistakes are discrete events, but failure is a state of mind, one they suggest we need not rest in. Why do so many of our great writers dwell on the failure of all the things they love? Faulkner on the failure of the South, of his idea of the South. Presumably, it is to help us, his readers, to see more clearly. James's Lambert Strether, who has given up hope for himself, advises his young friend, live, live all you can. It's a mistake not to. What my students argue for, it seems, is summoning the energy of persistence. Shift your focus from seeking discrete successes, the green light at the end of the dock, to honoring high purposes as Denver does at the end of Beloved. Of course, we will never realize all the ideals that are worth striving for, to do justice, to love kindness, to honor ourselves, the task that Leslie realized she had to take up, but also to honor other people's journeys. Though we will fall short as individuals, as a college, as a nation, we need not fall prey to petty quarrels. This is not honoring ourselves or the high purposes we believe in. Leslie entitles her autoethnology, The Art of Falling, Failing, and Forgiving. This art is worth reading about and putting into practice. Try again, fail again, fail better. Yeah, that's it. We need to fail better. Thank you.